Welcome, everybody. We are um, really excited to have this whole day workshop uh, focused on the Pacific Research Platform. Uh, and I'll give you a half hour introduction to what that's about. For those of you who don't know, most of you are actually involved in it. Um, so uh, that this will be really talking about what we've accomplished already in the first year and a half of this five year National Science Foundation grant. But then a number of you are here from OnVector <clears throat> and are less familiar with, uh, of, with this. So I'll try to deal with both of those. We've got a lot of really great technical discussions today. Uh, we are recording these uh, so we can put them up on the <clears throat> web uh, for people who, as we have found many, many places are beginning to get interested in this. I'll talk to you about the fact that we have um, a number of new applications uh, coming online, and it seems like uh, they don't stop. It just keeps coming. So um, with that, I think I'll get started. Um, so this all started with ESNet defining the science DMZs, and um, NSF then adopting this and funding over 125 campuses to have local DMZs on their campuses. Uh, so these are DMZs are, are networks that are separate from the shared internet but are optimized for high performance applications and big data. And in particular, they use a dedicated uh, data transfer node. So that was conceptually defined by the uh, ESNet. And, um, and then, as you'll see, we've implemented that. That's a critical aspect of what makes the PRP possible. All of this is deeply performance monitored, in fact, four times a day across all the campuses that are involved um, by John Graham, wherever he is. Um, here, John Graham, and I'll be pointing out a few, be pointing to a few talks that we're going to have later uh, as I go along. So uh, we decided to write a proposal uh, after we did a proof of principle here in California uh, for uh, to the NSF, and that was funded uh, for five years uh, by the National Science Foundation as the Pacific Research Platform. Now the Fiona's. Flash I.O. network appliances are the key thing that gives a uniform, uh, uniformity to our optical network uh, in that they are endpoints, meaning that the way I like to tell, say it is, you know, if, if, you're, if you're getting, say, currently 10, meg, 10 megabits or 100 megabits into your lab, and we come along and we say, good news, we're going to give you 1,000 times as many bits per second coming into your lab, well, you need a smart fast bucket to handle that. And so that's fundamentally what led us to think about this. All the components of the Fiona's are, they're standard PC, rack mounted or, or desk side, but they're optimized for big data and fast uh, movement. And they have 10 or 40 or a couple of 40 gigabit uh, network interface cards uh, on them as well. But the main thing is they've got a lot of flash. And it turned out that that's very important in terms of TCP IP working at these speeds uh, over layer three, which is what we're doing. More recently, <clears throat> for those who don't have quite as a, a demanding a bandwidth um, uh, load, uh, say you, you, know, you can get by with a gigabit per second, uh, we have the Fianet, which is instead of $8,000 down to $1,000. And um, these uh, can, um, handle um, a gigabit uh, per second, and in fact, uh, handle six hours continuously of that coming in. Uh, so, you know, and this is where you, you put it in your supply budget, you know, on your grant with your pencils. So this is what the um, PRP looks like. We propose to take all of the DMZs on these campuses and link them together into a regional and, as you'll see later, international scale um, DMZ. So the, uh, many of you have seen this map before, uh, the things that are, the campuses that are blue have independently gotten their own NSF 
campus grant, these typically ran about a half a million dollars each uh, to do a DMZ. Others in green had their own way of doing it. Uh, the fundamental thing is that this project would have been impossible had it not been for the many decadal uh, funding uh, by the members of Scenic. So Scenic is the California <clears throat> Research and Education Network, and this builds on that. Without that engagement, <clears throat> which involves all of the UC campuses, the Cal State campuses, the Stanford, Caltech, and um, uh, uh, USC, the private campuses, uh, uh, as well as all of the community colleges, K through 12, and libraries, uh, we couldn't begin to think about doing this. And so this is for others who want to do this kind of thing regionally. First thing is have a really good, robust regional optical network to build on, uh, because otherwise, for the amount of money we're getting in this grant, you could never think about doing it. Now the thing is that. What we want to do, Scenic, what does Scenic do? Scenic hooks up the campus gateways to each other in an extremely reliable fashion. And John Hess, who's somewhere here, I'm trying to introduce some of these folks, has been a critical person within Scenic who has uh, worked with us to organize uh, weekly phone calls of network engineers across the West Coast that have step-by-step -step debugged these network connections because what we're doing is going not we're, we're assuming you have perfectly working gateway to gateway we're going on to your campus to the end users on the third floor of the physics building or the second floor of the bio building where their computer is and we want to then do <clears throat> end to end 10 gigabits a second disk to disk a good fraction of that on a, on a continuous basis. Now that's a very difficult thing to do and the reason nobody has done it is it's no one's job. Because the way networks have evolved over the last 30 years in the United States since the NSFNet uh, was first introduced is to have a hodgepodge of management of networks. So if you're lucky and you've got a regional network that is very well run like Scenic to start with then once you get on the campus, each campus has a separate CIO driven policy on what you do at the networking. But it gets worse because every department's building is typically un not under the CIO, but under the department which knows nothing to first order about networking uh, to decide what to do. So there was no one's, there is no one in this country whose job it is to provide end to end performance. And so that's one reason that even though this seems like, duh, um, it was novel enough to get funded. <laughs> now, here's where we were a year ago. This is a diagram in which each of the columns and rows is a Fiona at one of the campuses. As you can see here, San Diego State, uh, UCSD, UC Irvine, UC Riverside, and so forth, and the color shows what is the measured uh, throughput, and the yellow is unable to retrieve data. Namely, it's not working. What? The oranges. The oranges, sorry. Yeah, it is different. The, the yellow uh, is a throughput of about five uh, gigabits, a uh, little less than five gigabits a second. The green is what we're looking for, which is greater than five gigs. And you'll notice that that's about 12 sites. Well, in the last year, it's now 20 sites, and most all of them are delivering greater than 5 gigabits a second, and as I say, John measures this uh, with his colleagues uh, four times a day. So we have this dynamically available uh, to um, understand. So it's from an engineering point of view, this is quite a collective achievement. Um, and in particular, uh, these DMZs are now connected at 10 to 40 gigabits, and we're, we're getting at least 7.5 uh, out of uh, 10 to 12.5 out of 40 uh, on a regular basis, 900 megs out of 1 gig. In some cases, we're up to 9.5 or something gigabits a second out of 10. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, and this is a, a tribute to the collective 
and sustained activity on a volunteer basis, none of these networking people are getting funded from this grant. This is a collective attempt to make something work that no one controls. It's quite, quite from a social point of view, I think you know people ought to be writing papers about this. Um, so uh, now one of the things that, of course, we've always done over the 30 years of bringing high performance infrastructure to the application community is whole workshops. And so uh, Camille Crichton, where is she? Here, Camille, who's a co-PI, as you saw, and Tom DeFonte, who's another co-PI, uh, will be talking more about the science engagement um, activity uh, later today. And uh, these are, I mean, it's almost like once a month, it seems like we're having one of these. And what we do is we try to tag it on to a meeting like, in this case, uh, the UC-wide research IT uh, meeting here, it's on vector, uh, so that I'll, we don't have to do ad hoc uh, uh, examples of this. And, and, and at supercomputing, we do a, a, you know things as well. So, um, and in fact, if people are interested in doing one at the upcoming supercomputing, let me know because uh, we could put a panel together or something. Now, as you know, uh, in the proposal, what we did is took a number of uh, big data uh, application areas and we selected them to have existing collaborative teams already working together on the science in multiple campuses. And that can include individuals working, but also that they need to get data repositories, they need to get access to supercomputers, they need to get access to even things like NSF clouds, like Chameleon. Um, and we then said, okay, if we come in and provide you a much enhanced end-to-end -end networked distributed data and compute environment, will that help your science? And we have over 50 scientists, such as Harvey Newman. Harvey, you want to put your hand up? And particle physics. <laughs> as an example, who uh, actually sent signed letters of commitment. <laughs> and again, none of them are getting funding that they would be part of this grand experiment. Um, one in particular, Shaw, where is Shaw? Shaw, Shaw okay, will be talking to you later today about uh, Santa Cruz. Now it turns out, you know, like I say, even though we have 20 uh, West Coast universities involved, some are more adventurous and ready to go than others. And I have to say that Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz, has been one of the finest partners in our uh, organization with multiple engagements. Um, and what you see here is the 100 gigabit per second Fiona uh, that uh, Shaw is uh, uh, putting in place. What they're doing is uh, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, which is if you've ever driven from Santa Cruz to Lawrence Berkeley Lab, you understand they are uh, centrally um, dislocated from each other. Um, uh, it is a very difficult way to get physically. But they are now hooked up at, um, I guess at 100 gigabits, um, uh, to the dark energy spectroscopic instrument, which <clears throat> is taking a dedicated observatory that is taking 250 images a night, generating essentially uh, a terabyte per night of data, and then being able to go into that, that's all processed at the uh, NERSC uh, Energy Supercomputer at LBL, take subsets of that and bring it back to the thousand node uh, Hyades cluster at, at, that the astronomers own at um, uh, an astrophysicist at Santa Cruz. And this is a mode that we see quite generally where centralized supercomputers are doing vast uh, complete databases. This is a uh, precursor to uh, uh, one that NCSA, for instance, will be doing five years from now. Um, and uh, then many different astronomers have their, you know, some are variable stars, some are supernovas, some are, uh, and they want to just take a subset of the data, but the, that data itself is so big that you need these kind of networks. All the way to uh, virtual reality. For instance, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Jeff uh, Weekly about uh, Merced and, and they built a um, virtual reality uh, facility. You, these are 
uh, in collaboration with uh, the Qualcomm Institute um, experts here. And then those are going to be hooked up so that we can do distrib distributed uh, virtual reality. Um, another one was earthquake engineering. So again, I looked for, when we put the PRP together, I looked for uh, pre-organized uh, uh, collaborators. And so if you can see here in the fine print, uh, the Berkeley-led uh, uh, Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center has, uh, as its uh, collaborators as part of PEER, Caltech and Stanford and Davis and San Diego and Los Angeles and Berkeley. So that includes shake tables, it includes big supercomputer simulations, and, and so they wanted to be able to took, take all of those uh, uh, collaborators and hook them together over the PRP. And here you can see uh, just two weeks ago John Graham uh, installing a Fionet. He and Tom DeFonte did a road trip as part of the PRP, spent an entire week on the road uh, going from San Diego to Santa Cruz to Berkeley and back, uh, uh, carrying uh, Fionas and Fionets uh, with them, um, and um, uh, actually hands-on hooking things up. I love the Tom's picture of the earthquake simulation laboratory, which I think is uh, sort of uh, uh, simulating uh, the aftermath of an earthquake, um, uh, but maybe not. But anyway, it's, it sort of looks that way. Uh, so, so my point is, in just showing you this, the virtual reality, Santa Cruz, and so forth, that all of the applications that we brought to the dance that were part of the original proposal are are actively uh, being hooked up, and in fact, we will have our 18-month review by NSF uh, in the next few months. Uh, to uh, find out if we are get the remaining funds, and we're, of course, pretty hopeful that will happen. But in the meantime, the word is out, and so the rest of this, I'm just going to talk about the new uh, uh, uses of the PRP that were not a part of the proposal. They're popping up like mushrooms after a warm rain, um, as we used to say in Illinois. So, uh, and some of them are based off things we're doing on the campus. For instance, we now offer the famous Scripps Pier, have uh, uh, optical fiber into the water to microscopes that are actually looking at uh, taking hundreds of thousands of pictures of these small creatures and then are using machine learning to go through those images and classify them. Um, the uh, uh, climate simulation where we are pulling down from in-car global climate simulations and then Dan Kayan and his team, are, Mike Dettinger, are doing 50-year projections on a highly uh, uh, localized uh, uh, areas in California and Nevada. So now NCAR has gone from 10 to 40 to 100 gigabits, including the Wyoming Supercomputer Center. And we just had a symposium for two hours in this room uh, with the, all the SIO uh, people and, and Marla Meal from NCAR was talking about all that they're doing to make that available. Now essentially what that means is to a researcher at SIO, <clears throat> Wyoming supercomputer and all of its data and climate and everything is, are sitting next to their desk. That's what it's effectively like, as opposed to being a very long, thin straw uh, to get there. And then you're going to hear uh, really fascinating work from Scott Sellers. So any of you on the West Coast uh, don't need to be told what an atmospheric river is anymore, right? <laughs> you, you get that, right? I mean, we just had it, we've had multiple examples of atmospheric rivers uh, dumping enormous amounts of rain on <clears throat> California. And this is an actual image of, of one of those. Well, we are fortunate to have an entire center uh, for Western weather and water extremes uh, here at SIO. And Marty Ralph, who is the head of that, is a world expert in this. And Scott Sellers, uh, who has been both at Irvine and now at San Diego, is doing some really fabulous work on hooking those together. Uh, and so you're going to hear a talk from Scott later today. Uh, and then the High Performance Wireless Research and Education uh, Network, which is doing uh, up to 155 megabit per second point to point, um, that is being extended by use of the PRP. And a lot of people said, but that's wireless. What's that got to do with optical networking? Well, we intend to expand HP-REN across Scenic. 
And Scenic has begun to think of this as a next phase of their activities professionally. And in particular, we are now in the final stages of the engineering to put a, a dish like you see over on the top of SDSC on the top of the Cal IT2 building at Irvine. And then that's connected by optical uh, PRP so that the servers there and the servers here, uh, as well as those at San Diego State, where's Eric Frost uh, back in the back, uh, we've got that hooked up at 100 gigabits now over to SDSU, so that's our test bed. We're now going to deploy this to Irvine and then to Riverside, probably. And that allows for data redundancy, disaster recovery, uh, and so forth. Now, this is one that's very dear to my heart because I've been working uh, with the leaders of the Ocean uh, Observatory Initiative uh, for over a decade. Uh, and it is now deployed off of the coast of Washington uh, by John Delaney and his team. And these are using re uh, purposed uh, commercial optical cables and you know that means that you can actually put eight uh, kilovolts down to the bottom of the floor a mile or mile and a half down as well as have multiple 10 gigabit uh, light paths back and so in particular uh, on this Juan de Fuca plate which is a plate fragment off of Washington uh, you now have over 140 scientific instruments a mile down that are reporting back over that to uh, Portland and then up to Seattle's Gigapop. Well, it turns out that fortunately John Delaney is going to be uh, having a honorific uh, three-month uh, visit to SIO and I just emailed him yesterday and he is already setting in motion what it needs to take the PRP up through the Pacific Northwest Gigapop and actually make it so that we can bring this back and this is what you're going to get. This is one of the uh, uh, axial seamounts. Uh, this is one of the hydrothermal vents. Remember, this is a mile down. And that is 40 HD images put together. So we're going to have that in on the wall. And then uh, every three hours, you have 14 minutes live of HD coming from the robots that are uh, uh, swimming around down there uh, and bring it back over the optical network. And we want to put that into the Birch Aquarium for public consumption, but also look about how we can uh, use this uh, more for science because, for instance, all the underwater seismographs, uh, those of you who might live in the Northwest know that uh, at any moment the big one could go off, in which case we're talking not Richter 7, we're talking Richter 9 and a vast tsunami. Um, uh, so uh, instrumenting that area is one of the most important uh, natural disaster things we could be doing. Um, now where we're going, I'll just finish with this, is that um, the PRP, the thing I find fascinating is that now that it's a platform, that's what we named it, right, you can begin to imagine building things on that platform that you couldn't have thought about doing before. In particular, Horst Simon, who's the deputy director at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and a longtime colleague of mine, de multi-decadal colleague in high performance computing, has been preaching now for a number of years that we're never going to get to the exascale if we don't start looking at non von Neumann pattern recognition uh, processors that are different than the standard Intel uh, and uh, NVIDIA GPU not von Neumann architectures. Um, and, and so in particular I've uh, worked with uh, Professor Ken Kortz Delgado to set up a pattern recognition lab in this building um, uh, back in 2015 and this is the first of the IBM uh, True North uh, uh, neural um, chips that uh, were delivered uh, and in addition Dan Golden who was the longest serving NASA administrator 10 years ago came set up a company um, startup to build brain like chips uh, that first board was developed here in this building uh, by uh, uh, Doug Palmer who then was hired away by this company to be their CTO and is working very closely with us so we have that in-house as well. Now what we find is that these things can execute very low energy and very fast but to actually train up neural nets like you're hearing about all the time that turns out to be computationally very intensive and typically uses massive amounts of GPUs and when we talked 
to those people, and Tom DeFani is the person who's responsible for organizing and finding these people, we found across the pre-existing um, PRP campuses, you know, we, we had gone out and we looked for the earthquake guys and the bio guys and the, and the particle physics guys and so forth, guys and gals, um, and uh, found them. But what we did not do was look for computer scientists. So now that we have all these good um, uh, relationships with these campuses, we went back and re-sieved them for computer scientists that were doing machine learning. And when we interviewed them, what they said is, you know, nobody will give us what we want. Um, you know, you can go to the cloud, AWS, and you can get uh, Tesla's, uh, the 64-bit uh, processors, but we don't need 64-bit processors. We need 32-bit processors, even 16-bit, even 8-bit processors because of the noise that's inherent in machine learning. And, and so what we just said is, well, gee, we've got these Fionas. We can plunk, as you see, eight of them, even 10 of them, GPUs into one of those Fionas. They're all set up for the big data that you're going to be cranking on. And they're connected to all the other places you might want the big data. But even more importantly, and I think um, uh, Phil Papadopoulos, where's Phil? Um, yeah, so he's another co-PI. He uh, is going to be giving a talk about how we can hook those all together with Condor maybe not these, but I mean across the PRP using uh, high, uh, high throughput Condor. So what we're, we've actually put a couple of proposals into NSF to say, well, what if we just were to put out over, say, 10 campuses where we found these users, so eight uh, GPUs per Fiona box, and then link them over the PRP with a high-speed backbone by Condor to make a cloud, essentially, of, of GPUs so that you can surge from your, you have the local control, which you love, but then you can surge out into the cloud just like the open science grid and, and use those uh, as well. And then through the Pattern Recognition Lab and Professor uh, Ken uh, Kretz-Degato, we have organized all the different machine learning algorithms, not just the deep belief networks that you're hearing so much about. Uh, and then we have uh, those being optimized on both these GPUs where you, and so the way is you use these GPUs to train up on the big data your nets, but then you can take those trained nets and put them over on these non von Neumann processors. And by the way, those can be on the whole new exploding generation of mobile platforms like drones and uh, robots and self-driving cars as, as well as smartphones. And so we think this is going to be basically the next big wave uh, for the coming decade and we want to be ready for it. Well, I'll just say that, um, you know, from the beginning, uh, with our, I guess I have to say, usual suspects, uh, we have put together an international extension of this, and as Case Delot and I were talking earlier, my case, uh, so uh, the, you know, Harvey is, of course, the world's expert on this, but the, when you have high bandwidth times large distance, TCP IP has problems. And so just because we can get it to work in California doesn't mean we can get it to work on a global scale. So that's why we wanted to have, for sure, uh, long latency uh, paths uh, that we could look into. And um, uh, many of our friends uh, from Japan and, and Korea and, and Netherlands and so forth are here. So just to wrap it up, um, this conference, what I've talked to you about is the past and a little glimpse into some possible futures. But what this whole conference is about is not the, PP, the first version of the PRP, which has got you know the routed uh, layer three architecture. Um, we've set it all up and so forth, but we're beginning now to actually move into what we proposed in the uh, original proposal to NSF, which is the PRPv2, and that's what your talks today are going to be about. And that's looking forward to uh, software-defined networks um, and exchanges uh, to IPv6, uh, being able to, um, we've got, as I said, from Shaw, first of the 100 gigabit um, Fiona's out there, so we can begin to look at those. Uh, these cooperating research groups, which I think are really fascinating idea that, that just the group that you're with um, and your collaboration are act able to access to the data and compute and so forth through secure authentication. Uh, and on that same fabric, though, the PRP, a different group can be, and you can't interfere with each other or get in each other's way. So that is another thing that I think is going to be security generally. 
So I'll just end by thanking all of our uh, funders. Uh, we have been fortunate enough that the Office of the President, uh, CIO, uh, and Vice, Pre Vice President for Research also saw the, the importance of this for the University of California and gave us some early funds to get going. The same as for the Chancellor on this campus with his uh, funding of the integrated digital infrastructure uh, and uh, a number of the longtime uh, collaborators. But most of all, I'd just like to thank all of you who, uh, for whatever, you know, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I think, what were these people thinking at, you know, when they decided to sign on? I mean, this is, this is not a small problem. <laughs> this is a big, big project. And it's only possible because of the 95% of the people involved are volunteers that are not funded through this grant, but are doing what we used to call in Illinois, collectively raising a barn, in this case, a cyber barn uh, of the PRP. So that's it. Uh, we're going to get on now to the other talks. Well, we, have some time for questions. we do have time for questions, Tom says. Four minutes ahead. Who would have thought? Any questions or comments? Harvey? Uh, looking forward to the next round. Hopefully, the <laughs> next grant, uh, do you foresee also applying for infrastructure funding so that we're a bit less all volunteers? <laughs> well, you know, I was just with Kevin Thompson. Um, I don't know, Harvey, you may have noticed there was an election. Um, <laughs> There's a great deal of uncertainty, uh, not just among the immigrant community in our country, but uh, in the funding agencies in Washington. They just have no idea what's coming. And there's also the um, Office of now what's called Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, the Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure, is looking for a new director. That, that area of NSF, that portion of NSF, includes both the supercomputer centers and this incredibly disruptive networking that Kevin Thompson spearheaded, um, but many others are involved as well now at NSF. Who knows what the future of that program is? So that's, it's a bigger uncertainty than normal, um, and I was just spending quite a bit of time um, you know, with some of the program officers um, they don't know. And it's not clear when they will know. Right? But you see the specter of closing down uh, the Endowment for the Humanities, Endowment for the Arts, perhaps. Department of Energy, um, Department of Energy is, you know, I'm sure there's going to be, there's, there's, it's a challenging time. So I hope that there will, my, my great hope would be that the NSF sees that what they've done through the last five years is build the foundation for what will become a national infrastructure at a scale of funding much larger than the PRP, um, and that that would be the logical thing to do. And, and, and Internet2, for instance, has already sent out a white paper to the administration talking about networking as infrastructure, and if we're going to have a trillion dollar infrastructure uh, program, then, you know, this ought to be part of it. Um, so it, there's a lot, there's as many good straws in the wind as there are concerning, and, but until the windstorm's over, we just probably aren't going to know. So actually, about 15 years ago in the Netherlands, uh, um, they had also this infrastructure program, and then uh, Erik Huyzer argued that if you would, that was also both infrastructure, if you would use the funding for one highway crossing for the digital Right, right. Phil, you can come on up and get ready. Yeah, uh, no, I mean, it's, it's crazy how um, effective the money going into this program is in terms of the productivity, scientific productivity, engineering, breakthroughs, and so forth. Uh, but that's not necessarily, you, you know, you're using logic case. And, uh, uh, you know, that's kind of in short supply these days, so. We're in a post-factual, post post-rational world, so, you know, hard to say. Thank you, Larry.